There's a Pali phrase that the Thayajans repeat a lot, Riddhiyena Dukkha Machetate. It's through effort that we put an end to suffering. And as John Lee says, we hear it, but we don't believe it. We're looking for the Pali phrase that would say, it's through relaxing that we put an end to suffering. We go through the canon, we try to find the passages that indicate that there's no need for an act of will as soon as you're developing admirable friendship, then everything is just going to follow right in line. In other passages where it seems to indicate that the path is one nice step after another nice step without much difficulty. And that's ignoring huge parts of the canon. And even those passages that say when you start with admirable friendship and everything follows. Well, admirable for friendship is not easy. Finding a good person, someone you trust, and then emulating that person's qualities. That's where it gets difficult. And of course, there are many passages in the canon where the Buddha says there's an aspect of developing skillful qualities that's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard. In fact, he says one of the advantages of getting the mind into concentration with a sense of well-being is it helps get you past some of the hardships that are involved in developing skillful qualities. It's not only unskillful qualities that lead to pain. Sometimes skillful qualities can, or the act of trying to develop them is going to be hard. You've got to put up with all kinds of things. There's even a passage where the Buddha said, if you've gotten to the point in your practice where sticking with a practice makes tears come down your face, he says, you'd be wise to stick with it. Even though there may be pain in the short term, there's going to be well-being in the long term. There's even that passage where he said that if you could make a deal, that someone would stab you with spears, a hundred spears in the morning, a hundred spears at noon, a hundred spears in the evening, every day for a hundred years, but with a guarantee that you would gain awakening at the end of those hundred years, he said it would be a good deal. And when you finally gained awakening, you would not feel that it was done with pain. The pleasure, and this is not a pleasant feeling, but there's a pleasure of freedom that comes with that is so overwhelming that it would blot out all the difficulties. So as we're sitting here looking for the path of relaxation, remember there's going to be some difficulties and you have to make effort. The right effort is not always just simply watching things. There are some states of mind that you simply watch, unskillful states of mind that are causing suffering, that when you watch them, they just go away on their own. They kind of wither away in front of your awareness. The fact that they've been causing suffering in the mind is simply because you haven't been paying attention. When you pay them attention, you say, I don't really want to go there. Why am I doing this? And you stop. But there are others that are not like that. They require what the Buddha calls a exerting a fabrication or fabricating exertion. We have to put forth an effort. There's going to be pains as you sit. Be thoughts coming up in your mind that you would really like to think, but you're going to say, no, can't go there. And there's going to be discomfort of all kinds. We had that question this afternoon about dealing with mosquitoes. What way of thinking about the mosquitoes would make them go away? Well, it's good to think about some of the stories of the Forest of Johns. That's a story with the John Lee. He'd gone out to sit in an orchard someplace and put down a mat. And then discovered that in putting down the mat, he had disturbed a red ant nest. And in a case like that, he said, okay, if, you, if I've ever done anything wrong to you, go ahead and bite me, as the ants came swarming around. But I haven't done anything to wrong you in the past. Please stay away. Let me practice, and I'll dedicate the merit of my practice to you. Now, in that case, the ants went away. But notice he didn't start out by saying, go away, or I'm spreading goodwill in your direction so you'll go away. He said, if I've wronged you in the past, okay, I'm willing to suffer the consequences. We have to have that attitude. Because after all, simply the fact that we're doing something nice here doesn't mean that everybody's going to treat us nicely. One of the Johns at Watasokarama was telling me that when he was a young monk, they were sitting at in the sala. In those days, the sala didn't have any fans. So at night, as they're sitting meditating, the mosquitoes were all over the place. I think he had somehow 
gotten the idea that if you breathed with your entire body, so the breath was coming in out of every pore, then it would sort of blow the mosquitoes away. But it wasn't happening. So he happened to open his eyes one night when John Lee was giving the Dharma talk. John Lee was up in the Dharma seat and realized that John Lee, the expert of breath, was covered with mosquitoes. So it's not always the case that the fact that you're sitting and meditating with lots of goodwill or lots of breath energy filling the body, that the mosquitoes will go away and leave you alone. To say nothing of the ants or the other insects or disturbing people. This is something even the Johns going off into the forest found that they had a lot of disturbing people they had to deal with. If it wasn't a matter of disturbing people, it would be a matter of disturbing spirits. So when lay people come here and say, well, the monks have it easy, they don't have, any, have to deal with a lot of people. It's not the case. We have to deal with all kinds of people coming here. And so when you go home, it's not all that different. You have less time to practice. But the fact that there are going to be disturbances, the fact there are going to be difficulties, is nothing new. It's simply a matter of having the right attitude toward them, which is a John Lee's attitude. If these people have been wronged by me in the past, okay, I'm willing to put up with the difficulty. If they haven't wronged me, maybe we live in peace. And I'd be willing to dedicate the merit of my practice to them. That's the attitude that means you're willing to take on whatever difficulties are involved. Remember, one of the better Zen passages is that statement that the great way is not difficult for those with no preferences. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't prefer to put an end to suffering over suffering. You do prefer that. What it means is that whatever the path entails, you're up for it. Whatever the difficulties, you're ready for them. Because you've seen that otherwise the mind is going to create a lot of suffering for itself. And the sufferings that come from people outside or situations outside are nothing compared to the suffering that the mind can create for itself. And that's what you've got to work on. That's the real difficulty, and that's where the real effort is going to be. Notice when the Buddha defines right effort, it's focused on the effort to get rid of unskillful mental qualities and to develop skillful ones in their place. In other words, the effort has to do with the mind. Effort's not simply a matter of sitting long hours, but it's a matter of being consistently on top of your mind to deal with the problems that are coming there. That's where the focus should be, and al allow the difficulties outside to fall into the background. See, accept difficulties as a good support. This is where the teaching on karma is helpful. It reminds you that, okay, there are things you've done in the past, some of which you have no idea what they are because they were done in another lifetime. And even though you've been good this lifetime, it doesn't mean you were always good. The fact that you're born as a human being means that you have some bad karma, because the human realm is a place where people with mixed karma go. So we're bound to meet up with difficulties. And so see them as training. I mean, the, the pain of having mosquitoes bite you is nothing compared to the pain that's going to happen as you approach death. If you can't put up with little pains now, what are you going to do with the major pains that come then? Well, the pain of having a relationship end is nothing compared to the pain that comes when you're going to have to give up all your relationships to all things in the human realm. So on the one hand, look at it as the price that comes from having been born as a human being. And secondly, sometimes remember that sometimes bad things that happen to you in the world outside can actually lead to a good result. 
both the John Fu and the John Suat were talking about really good insights that they gained, important insights that they gained in the meditation that came when they were ill. And in John Fung's case, it was a persistent migraine that went on and on and on for months. And in John Suat's case, it was a case of malaria. And as John Fung explained, he began to realize that he had gotten so obsessed with putting an end to the headache that he had forgotten that what's the duty with regard to pain. It's not to make it go away. Is to comprehend it and to look at where the real pain is. It's the pain in the clinging. It's not the pain in the head. It's the pain in the clinging. It's an activity you're doing. You're not just on the receiving end. You're actually paining, suffering, thinking of it as an active verb. And that's something you've got to comprehend. So the pains and the difficulties of the practice are an important part of it. You learn some very important lessons. After all, the first noble truth is the truth of suffering. You're going to have to watch it and understand it before you get past it. And that's going to require effort. The idea that you can simply relax and the unconditional will come through your relaxation has nothing to do with the path. It's based on a wrong idea about the relationship between the fabricated and the unfabricated. There's an idea that made its way into Buddhist circles that, after all, because the fabricated just creates fabrications, more fabrications, and you can't do anything that would lead to the, the goal. Therefore, you have to just go around doing, doing nothing, not fabricating. That's how the unfabricated will appear. Well, it's a very simplistic notion of causality. The Buddhist notion of causality is a lot more complex. It's like the complexity of nonlinear systems, which simply relaxing into the system doesn't ever get you out of the system. It's by pushing the different elements in the system. You can actually, by following the internal laws of the system, make it break down. And that's how you get out. So the pushing, where is the pushing right now? Dealing with suffering, dealing with pain. We practice concentration so the mind will have an alternative place of well-being to stay. To give itself a good foundation so it can deal with the pain and not feel threatened by it. But it doesn't mean the pain is going to go away. If you could just go into jhana and then wipe out all pain and not have to deal with it again. The Buddha wouldn't have taught discernment the way he did. He used right concentration to comprehend pain, to comprehend suffering. Realizing where the real cause is. It's not in the physical pain. It's not even in the anguish. It's in the clinging. When the mind is well settled, it can develop a dispassion for that clinging, and then dispassion for the cause. So this is how the path attacks the problem. Remember, the Four Noble Truths are set out as cause and effect. Unskillful causes, bad effect, skillful causes, good result. But those skillful causes, they don't create the deathless. What they do is they get the good result of developing this passion. As you get the mind to settle down, you begin to see, oh, this is how I've been creating suffering. This is stupid. And you let it go. And then you realize that the only thing still weighing down the mind is the path. Well, you let that go, too. But you don't let it go until you've developed it. If you let it go before you develop, it's like that image of the relay chariots. You're supposed to go all the way to Sawati, but you get off the first chariot and say, okay, I'm going to rest here. You never get there. I like the image of the cow. Want milk out of the cow and you've been squeezing the horn. 
and you find you're getting nothing from your efforts, and you stop squeezing the horn. You say, oh, this is much nicer than squeezing the horn. It's nicer for me, nicer for the cow. But the problem is you still don't get any milk. You've got to develop the path. In, the, in this case, you find out where which the right part of the cow to squeeze is, and then you work at it, and you get the results. So even though we would like to relax our way to awakening, it's not going to happen. It's only through through effort that suffering is overcome, that suffering is ended. Once we're willing to admit that, then we can get to work.